Okay, hello, welcome back to another game of chess. Today we are playing with e4 as per usual. Our opponent is going to respond with a Sicilian. Of course, we're going to play the Mengarini here with move a3, uh, going for this sneaky idea if knight c6 to play b4 and lash out on the queen side wing here. Uh, however, if they go for, okay, let's see, e6, then uh, we will just go knight f3 and play our standard open Sicilian ideas of going knight f3, breaking with d4, taking inwards with the knight, and then uh, knight c3. This bishop will leave for a little. We're not entirely sure where it wants to be. It might want to be on e2, might want to be on c4, maybe even b5. Often our opponent, the Sicilian, will play the move a6 to prevent bishop b5. Um, but the point is that we're not entirely sure where we want to commit this bishop to yet. It could serve excellent purposes on any of these three squares. So instead, we're going to play knight to c3, uh, defending the pawn, and this is just the only square this knight is really going to belong on. Um, and so that's that's sometimes a good way to think about which order to develop your pieces, bishops uh, or knights first. Generally speaking, the principle is knights before bishops because they have more obvious squares uh, that they're going to develop to. So they go for d6 as well as e6. Now, the fact that they've played e6 means their bishop does not defend g4. Now, you might be thinking, why would I care about that? The reason is that I kind of want to play bishop to e3, stabilize the knight, get the bishop out here it's ready to play queen d2 and maybe castle queenside as an option um but if bishop e3 normally there's a knight g4 move let's say our, our opponent's pawn was back on e7 uh, to punish that bishop being here but now we can play this without going for the preliminary bishop e2 or f3 uh to over defend this square okay so our opponent's gone for bishop to e7 telegraphing that they are going to castle kingside so we're gonna have a very classical uh game here in which i'm gonna play f3 i'm gonna play queen d2 and then I'm gonna castle queenside, although they do both bishops like this, and then go a6, being very passive here, kind of like hippo style. The reason I played f3 here, by the way, was because I can't play queen d2 without relinquishing my control of g4. Um, so f3 first, queen d2, and also f3, a very multifaceted move, defending g4, also supporting the g4 square, and supporting the e4 square, adding a bit of stability to the center. Um, I think we do wanna go for g4 here, actually. I really like this idea of just, just lashing out straight away. We're going to go for it. Basically, the point is, if our opponent castles this way, which is looking very likely as they have no C-pawn, so castling queenside, probably going to be a bit of a shaky idea with all these dark square weaknesses and my bishop already pointing here. That looks like a bad move. So if they're not going to castle queenside, you can relatively reasonably deduce that they're going to castle kingside. Because uh, if they stay in the center, it tends to be that the castle player is going to have the safer king, and then I can try and tear open the center, get the bishop out, whack the rooks in the center, and uh, hopefully do some damage. So if we can force our opponent's king to eventually end up on g8, I mean, why would we not play h4 here? Why would we not go a g4 and h4 preemptively claiming space over this way? There's no way they castle this way. They might do it, though. I mean, they, they still have not committed to castling either way. I haven't committed either. However, I have played h4 g4 and f3 so castling kingside maybe not the best idea uh, which by i mean could be an absolutely horrible idea now okay remember how i said this bishop weren't exactly sure where it wanted to go i think i just want to put it on e2 um if we go out to c4 here then there's b5 with tempo hit the bishop and yeah i could maybe drop back but then this pawn might be rolling this way and if i want to castle queenside probably not the best idea or at least it's a little uncomfortable. So I'm just gonna go with bishop e2. And uh, this is kind of like a, it's kind of like in the in like the Wild West movies where you've got two cowboys standing opposite each other. We're both staring at each other now, having completed the development of all the pieces. I've invested more in this kingside expansion here. Uh, and my opponent seems to be primed to play b5. The question is, you know, neither of us are castled. Which way are either of us gonna castle? And they commit their rook to c8 here. Meaning they had three options, don't castle, kingside castle, or queenside castle. They have now ruled out queenside castling as an option. And I'd imagine kingside castling is extremely unpleasant because the second they go this way, we can go g5, tear open the h file, uh, slide across with the queen and, and just checkmate along there. So I think, realistically speaking, they're going to keep their king in the center, which makes sense under all of this uh, defense here. And if, if I castle, like they're going to run with this pawn, they're gonna move their knight, uh, maybe trade it off like this, and they're gonna try and checkmate me on here. So I do need to be careful. I still have all three options, technically speaking. Castling kingside. Okay, we castle queenside. Let's say we see like b5. 
Is there an obvious way for me to like tear open the center? Should I play f4? Now that the bishop on e2 supports g4, maybe? You know what, guys? We're castling. We're castling kingside. We're castling queenside, sorry. We're getting the rook onto the d-file, onto one of the central files on the board. Beautiful stuff. We are connecting the rooks, which is more than can be said for our opponent. If you don't move your king, your rooks will not see each other. The king will just perpetually be in the way. Uh, and the reason it's very good for our rooks to see each other is that I'm going to go for a very speedy g5. And if you take, I will then take here. These rooks will then be staring at each other down the h-file. You cannot let me take because you're getting sourced here. Um, and if you trade, then my other rook can take here, which is definitely an advantage. Okay, we're going to take with the bishop. Probably we see e5. I guess, mm, I don't know if that's a probable move or just a possible move. But if we do see e5, it frees up the, uh, the d5 square for the knight. So I think our opponent's position is looking a little bit uncomfortable here. I uh, had to be careful I wasn't seeing ghosts and actually just, you know, castle queenside and carried on with my hopefully faster attack. Because I'll be honest, yes, this kind of looks a bit scary on the same file as my king, but at the moment it doesn't seem to be even slightly concretely uh, possible. Because even if they went b5 now, they're not threatening b4 immediately because I can just take. And the queen holds c2. Yeah, I think my position's really nice. And I think the reason it's really nice is, again, because of that decision that our opponent made with the king. And we just have this immediate threat of g5. If bishop, uh, sorry, if e5 will go bishop here, then g5 dislodge the knight and probably put the knight here into d5. Hitting the queen, hitting the bishop, beautiful outposted square. So e5 definitely has its drawbacks. If you don't play e5, you just leave my bishop on a beautiful diagonal here. And it's not entirely obvious that it was a good idea to trade the knights. They go for b5, okay g5 i mean it feels like the move it's got to be the move forcing this knight to move maybe they go to h5 i'd be very surprised though because then we play f4 and attack the knight again with the knight g3 wow like rook g1 knight takes maybe we could take backwards with our knight preempting okay yeah this can't be a good move though because now we take here and as i explained our connected rooks will surely reign supreme here. Now I'm just threatening rook h8 infiltrating here. And our opponent has finally and completely uh, with this move here on move 16 ruled out the possibility of castling kingside. They will never castle this game. And um, there will certainly be a price to pay for that. Especially the fact that this rook has unfettered access to the most viciously exploitable part of the board. Okay, do we go for this check or do we step back first? Hold up, wait, 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 wait. This is just hanging. What? If I take, you take, I take, you take. Oh, that's really interesting, actually. What if I take, you take, I take? <laughs> this is weird. Let's say I take, you take, I go rook h8, force the bishop back, and then take here. That could be a good idea. That could be a really strong idea. I get a knight, my opponent gets a bishop. And then if I take here, they can play bishop takes f6. And if I go check, they can move the king up to e7. So I'm thinking, maybe we play pawn takes. Pawn takes d4. Rook h8 first, forcing bishop f8. And then recapture here. Because if you take, I'm going to take with the queen. And we're going to be up a pawn and we're going to be exploiting this. That looks really pleasant to me. Although if takes, takes. Here, bishop f8, queen d4. Then let's say they play g6. Because they don't want any shenanigans on, uh, on g7. Is that a playable move? I can't move the knight at that point because there is then a threat of checkmate on c2. I'd love to be able to play... Like knight d5, but I can't. Okay, to be honest, why are we not just stepping back here? Bishop e3. Yeah, guys, we're just going to go bishop e3. I think I was overcomplicating this by calculating taking the knight and all of this stuff with the rook check, the bishop back. Like, we can just move the bishop. And our opponent is in a far worse position. Their knight can't jump forward. They have to go back. Now we play this, maybe. And king f 8 defending it? This looks shaky, I'll be honest, guys. We're going to go in here, though. 100% we're going in here. Exploiting this back rank. King f8 seems to be the only move here. 
Because you can't move the knight, you move the bishop, the knight hangs, you move the queen, the rook, the bishop, the knight's just gonna hang. Yeah, you have to play king f8, okay. They go for it, now knight d5? I mean, this has to be a good move, right? Knight d5, we hit the queen, oh, of course our queen defends checkmate, that is very important. We hit the queen, we hit the bishop. This is, this has to be better. This just has to be better. And I'm really thinking we go bishop d3 to like just permanently cement this here. Oh, 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 little tactic, guys. Little tactic, rook takes knight. Force the king to take, divert it from the defense of the bishop. And then not only taking a bishop, but we are forking here and we should win the game. Probably even resignation before our opponent takes the rook. There we go. Beautiful end to that game using the open h file um i was thinking if they'd gone here i might have gone bishop d3 and queen h2 tried to get into h7 that could have been fun but let's have a look at the analysis okay so here we are in the analysis if we have a little scroll down here you can see basically a perfect game i'll be honest 95 percent accuracy with two inaccuracies one of them being from plus six to plus 4.5 i mean we can't really consider that as a major uh, a major fault of mine because you know we're still completely winning here okay apparently bishop e2 was slightly inaccurate but we're still winning the graph basically seems to be a relatively smooth transition to a completely winning position uh bars are right there 95% accuracy that was nice that was really nice and we ended the game with three minutes 14 left which is really nice um okay right let's uh let's go through the game so e4 if we turn on the database here uh, c5 and then, okay, I played a3, which the Megan Greeny variation, of course. Masters don't really play this. However, I uh, play this a lot. Will Taylor Chess is white here. Actually, will you be able to see that? Yeah, okay, so my face cam might be a little bit in the way of this. However, uh, if we just go back and move here, 95% of the time, um, I play the move a3 here. I've got a 49% win rate, which is not horrible, uh, given that there's also a little, there's a little, there's a sliver of a draw rate in there. I'm not amazing against the Sicilian. However, if a3, you can see, Oh, maybe you can't see who knows that that jumps up to 53 against 96 so you know we do have a pretty good record um in these lines but with e6 i tend to not perform as well knight f3 knight c6 okay now we do well what what, what happened oh okay if people play d5 i just apparently lose like all the time there okay sorry uh they go knight c6 d4 here and after takes takes okay yeah this makes sense because knight f6 and i've played four games in this line and won all of them that is good to know okay i uh, will brush up on other inaccuracies in the future however if we turn on the engine here knight c3 uh, of course we correctly reasoned that was the best move uh, the pawn goes here and then at, again using that reasoning of um there being no uh there being no bishop's defense of g4 let's just have a quick look actually if our opponent had gone for a line where they played d6 Let's say knight here, here, takes, takes, and takes, knight f6, here, here, and then I go bishop e3. You can see, okay, this is awesome. This is exactly what I was saying. You can see knight g4 here is a problem, because of course queen takes is not an option, because there's no pawn on e6. The bishop defends this knight. This means uh, we would either have to move the bishop uh, if we didn't want to trade it off, which we definitely don't want to trade it off, um, and, you know, any bishop move is just not very strong. I mean, there's even queen b6 here, and that is going to be a big problem. So obviously noticing uh, that instead of this there was a pawn on e6 uh, and we were able to play bishop e3 it is now the best move then we went for f3 nice queen d2 excellent g4 best move by the way move 10 g4 and yeah this this gets really nice because i go for h4 which is one of the engine's top moves uh queen type queen type castles and h4 okay h4 just best move are you joking g4 h4 this is lovely move 11 and i've already played g4 h4 um, bishop e2, okay, yeah. Queen side castles would have kept on the pressure a little bit more. I kind of wanted to to make my opponent make the, you know, psychologically committal decision um, of where to castle first. And as you see, okay, they could have gone for d5, they could have castled queen side, but castling king side would have been suicide here uh, because g5, and you know, if you take here, takes, and there's just no way you're not getting checkmated here, plus seven uh, on the evaluation. So, you know, castling, uh, the fact that they couldn't castle kingside, which is what their opening would really lend itself to. Most Sicilians, we could, you're playing c5, you want to castle uh, kingside. The fact that they couldn't do that obviously made them very uncomfortable. They played c, uh, rook c8. I castle queenside, which is the best move. And from here on out, we took with bishop. And as I said, e5, we just go uh, bishop back to e3, although that was the best move because it gives, okay, I guess it gives e6 to the bishop. 
Uh, but you see we are just better here going for ideas of g5 and also back to d5. They go for b4 here, I mean, sorry, b5. We go g5, and as I said, taking horrible mistake uh, because our rooks are connected. Now, if they'd gone knight to h5, I think I'd have played f4, is what I said. Knight g3, rook g1, knight takes, and knight takes was my plan. It would have been more accurate to play queen takes, but I, I, was, I was happy to go into this position and just have an absolute pawn storm ready to crash through on this king. Um, I'm still bare here, so that's good to see. However, opponent of course takes, uh, takes, takes, and then yeah, this is an immense problem. And they go for this with some counterplay. I should, I should have actually gone for the line I was calculating, takes, and if you take, then I go rook h8, bishop here. I, I don't have to play queen takes here, I'm so stupid. Yeah, that is really short side. If you guys were screaming at your screen, watching me calculate uh, queen takes d4 here, please forgive me, because that is abysmal. I could have, of course, taken here and then uh, picked this up, promoted, and just had an absolutely lovely life. Uh, we could have promoted to a queen and just had multiple queens on the board, which would have been good. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, because it kind of ended up being a little more artistic, uh, going in with the rook to h8 here, forcing king f8, knight d5, and then this beautiful move, best move, the move to make it a 95% accurate game, rook takes g8, forcing the only move here would have been king here, then knight takes bishop, of course, forking the uh, the king and the rook, and also winning the bishop. And even, even if we didn't get the rook in the end, two minor pieces for the rook would definitely be worth it. We'd have a lovely bishop pair and be better in the end game. But after the king moves, um, oh, queen d6 into met, so look at that. Because you save your rook, and I can probably do some very dank things like bishop c5, are you joking? And the king can't run away because the knight holds this square. This, that is outrageous. Knight d5 check, king here. <laughs> wow, okay, that's that's ridiculous. Um, but obviously, sorry, the point is that I could have just taken this rook as well um, and been absolutely and completely winning because whatever they recapture with, I could take the pawn here. Bishop pair, if we trade off the queens, um, this is going to be the easiest end game I have ever played. So thank you very, very much for watching. Hopefully that was a really pleasant game, really pleasant tactic and has made your day better. Now, if you don't mind, we're going to stick around for an ad read at the end of the video. Don't click off the video, don't click off the video, don't click off the video, don't click off the video. Do you love chess? But the board you own doesn't quite match your passion for the game. You want more. More! More! What more could I want from a chess board? Introducing the sponsors of this video, Go Chess. Particulars Go Chess is the third in their trilogy of game innovation. Having already served over 300,000 happy customers with Go Cube and Go Dice, Particular claims to be bringing us the most advanced and powerful chess board ever invented, and it's easy to see why. Go Chess is a self moving, fully robotic chess board with many awesome features. This board allows quick board auto setup, automatic puzzle setting, historical games replay and real-time movement tracking. The user-configurable light system on the board provides real-time coaching, which includes suggestions of possible best and worst moves. Check out their Kickstarter link in the description where they've already raised nearly a million dollars to bring the world this awesome product. I think this is a super cool bit of technology and I'm so excited to be part of its journey to success. Thanks for watching.